Are the new French medium tanks worth grinding? Which one is the best? And should you drop everything and start getting it right now? Or are they just nice to have, but not necessary? Let's find that out. I'm gonna go through all of the vehicles right here. Let's start off with their stats. All four of the vehicles are two short auto loaders, so that's very straightforward and nice. The alpha damage increases gradually for each vehicle, and so does the penetration, so no outliers there, even though the tier 10 standard penetration isn't as high as it could be, and the heat penetration is only 305, so that's not really that great, but more on the tier 10 later. Now, the tier 7 as well, not really great penetration, so penetration is not the strong suit of these vehicles. However, the alpha damage, 220 at tier 7, 330 and 370, is relatively decent so that's not too bad there the weapon handling is again largely like it is in the firepower the tier 7 and tier 8 are very similar and the tier 9 and tier 10 are very similar as well 1.8 seconds aim time and then the tier 9 and tier 10 we have 1.7 dispersion 0.33 the tier 8 here is better at 0.32 which is very nice uh but then a 0.328 here at the tier 9 and the 0.324 at tier 10 so basically they all have roughly the same accuracy. You won't really be able to tell the difference between the uh, 4% right here, between 0.333 and 0.319. You can't really tell the difference in battle. Obviously, it is very small, so you can ignore that. Obviously, the tier 8 has a slightly worse movement dispersion, so that sort of balances out. So accuracy pretty much stays largely the same. But there is obviously a slight improvement in the aim time here, uh, up to tier 9, but it largely stays the same. Gun depression increases from 7 at tier 7 to 9 at tier 10. It would have been nicer if it would have been 7, 8, 9, 10, but uh, can't have nice things. So, again, very gradual increase there. Again, weapon handling is one of those things that doesn't really increase over the tiers. That's the DPM and penetration. Now, the mobility of this vehicle, again, basically the same, 22 all the way through. The tier 10 is slightly worse here at 21, but it makes up for that with more traverse speed at 50 which the tier 7 also has a 48, so you have fast traverse, then it goes down slightly, and then it goes up again. And camouflage, again, somewhere around 25% for most of them, so the mobility is very similar right here. Got a little bit of a change in top speed, we're going up 5 kilometers an hour uh, from tier 8 to tier 9, and then we stay there. So that's uh, another gradual increase from 8 to 9 right here, just like we have in the DPM, just like we have uh, in the aim time as well. 7 and 8 are very similar, and then we have a gradual jump towards tier 9, and then the tier 10 is all largely similar to what the tier 9 has to offer here as well. And then down here, in the hit points, of course, those are going to increase gradually, and then the armor goes up as well, whereas the MX doesn't really have any. The tier 8 has a little bit more armor, and the, then we have less armor slightly on the tier 9, but then we have a lot more, especially on the turret, of the tier 10 but i will talk about the armor of the tier 10 specifically a little bit later uh, but generally the other vehicles again the uh, tier 8's turret is pretty good but most of the time these vehicles are very easy to penetrate so nice progression here that we have it's also if you are a good player it's going to be a very easy line to learn because largely the playstyle of all those four vehicles is going to be the same I haven't really played the tier 7 all that much, but for what I've seen, it is quite an enjoyable vehicle. Now, it does have an AMX-13 hull and an M24 Chaffee turret, but it is a medium tank. It doesn't really have medium tank armor, but if you've played the AMX-1375 before, you sort of know what this vehicle is going to be all about. The difference, obviously, is this vehicle has two shells with 220 alpha damage, but generally, this is a tier 7, especially if you are a good player, that is very enjoyable and can be played at an extremely high level. Obviously, one of the big downsides that I didn't mention in the stats part is that the turret is at the back of the vehicle, which is generally always going to be a downside unless the vehicle is extremely good at side scraping, like a VK90 and can take advantage of that. But generally, you have the turret at the back. Obviously, you will have to peek the engine compartment first, and that exposes you to the enemy a lot more than if you can just simply have the turret in the middle or even at the front. So that is a slight disadvantage right there. But the other vehicles of this tech tree don't have that, so we're going to get rid of that problem later. They all going to have two short autoloaders, of course. So we're going to stay very consistent there. And that is what is very important about a tech tree as well, is that it is consistent. Nobody wants to play 
uh, AT-15 and a tortoise and then go to the 183, which is entirely different to the two vehicles previous. So here we have a tech tree that is quite in line with each other, which is always lovely to see because that makes the process and the progress of grinding it a lot easier and a lot more enjoyable because you can just simply learn how to play the tier 7 and then apply what you've learned to the next vehicle, the tier 8, tier 9, tier 10, and then increase your skill with each tier as you should because obviously the higher you go, the more difficult it's going to get. The players aren't going to get any better, but the battles are going to get more difficult nonetheless. Now, you know, a game like this, obviously, what I want to do is I want to play on the two-shot autoloader. I don't want to expose myself unnecessarily, just drive around, find a place where I can put the two shells into an enemy, and then disappear again to reload, because that is what the advantage of a fast autoloader is going to be. Clip, run, clip, run, clip, run. That is ideal, what you want to do here. And uh, obviously, that 12T up there, he sort of could know that I'm in this position, but he doesn't, so I can just simply put two shells into him. And obviously, again, I'm going to go back into hiding. A 3v5, that's kind of what I want to do now, because this is the time to preserve hit points right here. If I was on the team with the five players, I could be a little bit more optimistic with my hit points and trade them more. But in this case, I will obviously need them for the end battle, because the enemy still has five enemies alive right here. So I'm going to try to preserve my hit points while hopefully taking out a couple of enemy guns. And the MX-12T does present himself very nicely here. And the, there you go. The gun mantle of this vehicle does have some protection behind it. So, again, if you're an MX-12T and you're fighting a tank like that, that is looking at you, that is a tier higher than you, that has more alpha damage than you, you're probably not doing it right anyway. Ideally, want to fight, especially if you're in a tiny tank like an IMX 12T, you always want to fight enemies that aren't looking at you, you always want to fight enemies that don't shoot back at you, that don't look at you. In this case, I have the advantage that I still do have a heavy tank teammate down there who is very high hit point, which means that the enemies are also closer to that enemy, so obviously they're going to focus on the M6, they're not going to just drive around the M6 and focus on me, so that is what is very important here. If you, especially if you're in a vehicle like this, you do not want to be the first point of contact for the enemy team, because you simply don't have the armor to tank the shots, and you also don't have the DPM and the consistent fire, because you're an autoloader, to actually fight that. So in a situation like this, you want the heavy to take contact first, so you can play around the heavy and then attack whatever enemy is currently in your view, and obviously if you don't see one, you have to reposition and try to help out your teammate in that situation. Because obviously there is no gain in using my armor and the M6's firepower when the inverse is more effective, of course. But here he goes, the enemy MX, and that is the MX M12. And now we go to the Iraq 105 Proto. The DPM doesn't really increase, the penetration does, and the alpha increases to 300. So we got 600 clip here, which is very nice. And for some tier 8 tank destroyers that is enough to kill them in two clips but obviously because the alpha damage is higher you're gonna have a longer reload because the dpm doesn't really change all that much from the tier 7 to the tier 8 so obviously the size of this vehicle is also quite a lot bigger so you're gonna have to be more careful with this vehicle than you have to with tier 7 you don't have the turret at the rear anymore which is lovely but your dpm is not going up by that much and 1900 dpm is kind of solid for a tier 8 heavy but for a medium not that much so two shells right here i have see but when you have enemies like that who needs skill if you have enemies like that but nonetheless you want to play this vehicle even more carefully than the tier 7 because your reloads longer your tanks a bigger target it's easier to hit don't have the rear turret problem anymore but you're trading that for a longer reload and obviously the larger size especially on the hull which can be penned very easily obviously the upper plate is very well sloped so if somebody's trying to shoot at that from a flat angle the shell is going to bounce uh, but every useful and intelligent player is never going to fire at that plate intentionally so yeah obviously this is what the tank splits we're talking about so the amount of players that actually know what they're doing is very proportional to the amount of people that actually know what they're doing not very many so, there's a lot of people that think they know how it's going, but they don't. I have no idea, either. But here's the thing. That G-Saw just peeks out, he doesn't know what's going on. Like, he could have sort of guessed that that air rack is spotted, 
And the other Arak, which is me, is up here. So he should have peeked at that. Should have been more careful, especially as a one shot right there. And what about I do now in a 2v4 situations? Two clip, two clip right there. So four of these shells are going to be enough to kill most of the enemies, especially the tier sevens. That is going to be enough. So ideally, want to play together here. It's not like last battle where one has the armor and the other one has the, the clip. This time, both have no armor and both have the clip. So ideally, I don't want to be uh, putting this guy into any trouble, but I still don't want to be the first point of contact because he has 200 hit points more than me. So in that regard, that is useful. Now, here it, it comes the Kyler. Again, he doesn't really look much what's happening around him. Obviously, I fluffed the second shot. I haven't really done much yet in this battle, so I'm going to have to be very careful. And obviously, with the longer reload here, uh, something like the Kyler, something like the Air Max can approach very quickly. And if they do that, it is going to be very difficult to ward them all off. Because, obviously, 4v2, if they all play together, which, of course, they're never going to do, then it is going to be very difficult to actually fight that. Now, three of them are around here, but the Actiga, he just sits there. The MX pushes too far. He gets himself killed. He had quite a lot of hit points. The Kyler also had a lot of hit points, but now he doesn't have any. And he just jumps down on the Arak, despite knowing I'm up here and I can one-shot him. And he just jumps down, and here is the Tiger. I got another shot. The Arak got two shots, and he's finished off. And where is the Silencer? Where is he? Nowhere to be seen on the entire planet. And he does have a two-shot auto lever, so that can be dangerous, but... As long as we play together here, that is going to be perfectly fine. And he has less than 600 hit points, so a kill here is going to be likely. He pushed forward. He put himself into an out-of-place spot where he doesn't belong. Because you don't play in a tank store against the medium in the medium's playground. Nonetheless, that vehicle works. And it is quite nice to play as well. Obviously, watch out for the size and watch out for the long reload. Don't play it too aggressively, because then you'll have a problem. This vehicle does have less reload again. Still has more alpha damage. Now we're going up to 2,500 DPM, which isn't all that much compared to other tier 9 mediums that have over 3,000, but you do have a 660 alpha damage clip in the two shells that are offered here. And um, why am I in the city with this vehicle? Well, here's the problem. I'm the only medium on this team. The enemy team has two mediums. Optimally, you would want to contest the medium side, win the medium fight, and take those out. But because that's not going to happen, because my team is going city, I decided that we need to gain the advantage here. You always want to gain the advantage on one side of the map. Ideally, clear out that side before the enemies on the other side are able to come around. If the, the enemies are split, of course, because not every advice applies to every battle. You know, that is somewhat clear. So, if you can gain an advantage on one side, you have to push that side, reinforce that side. You never want to bolster out the disadvantage on the other side. Like, if there is an enemies that are fighting two versus four, you making a three versus four isn't going to help them. But you taking out two, three enemies on the other side of the map might be a lot more helpful than you just simply dying with the rest of your teammates in a disadvantage. Now, again, we got rid of those two heavies. A lot of hit points, a lot of firepower already off the map. And the only thing the enemy team achieved so far is kill a SU-12254, which does have 4,000 DPM and should have lived much longer. But no less, 2v1 trade right here. And now this CC is pushing forward into a very bad position for himself because there is no cover from this place. Neither from the Scorpion nor from me there is any cover for that CC. And if... Some of the teammates jump down on him. There is no cover and no way of getting out for him either. So he completely compromised himself. So has the SMV, the other one that is already dead. He just simply drove out in the open. And we had the overmatch right here. Here's the enemy Project Louis. He's now out there in the open. And here's the thing. Going to the medium side is most often beneficial. But getting a decisive advantage when you can is even more beneficial. So when you have a situation like this, make sure that you push, throw, and you take out the enemies. And also hope that the enemies are as incompetent and they are as they are, uh, because they're just going to push right into the team. And uh, generally, the city is not the place to be. But if the enemy is terrible like this, 
then he can work as well. And that's 3,500 here for the Louis, despite not having a perfect start uh, with only one versus two mediums. But if you apply the vehicle around the map usefully and you also inspire your team in a way, hopefully, to push with you, to attack with you on the emeralds, you're going to have a lot of great battles there. And because the T9 and the T10 are more interesting and more important, really, let's play another one with the Louis. Obviously, at the start of the battle, what I want to do, I want to take a advantageous position quickly and catch an enemy off guard that is also moving into this position. And the enemy Project Louis is doing the same. Now, this repeak wasn't really necessary, but I went for it anyway, because why not at this point? It's not a wise move to do, but it's fun. And the game's supposed to be about fun, so remember that. Your stats won't matter to you in 100 years, or whatever, or 50 years. What your blitz stats were don't fucking matter. If you had fun or not, will matter. But if you still want to be a good player, then take an advantageous position at the start of the battle, and then try to catch somebody off guard that's traversing into position. And also, obviously, always be aware of any spot that enemies can be in, because there is an enemy AT-15, so it would have been likely to camped up in a tank destroyer spot, but there is a, a Yo and a Lorraine up there instead. And obviously, you saw the enemy's Project Louis complete unawareness, where he just sits out in the open and exposes himself to me, and then I can very easily finish him off there. So don't do that, right? Because here's the thing. You can have fun as much as you want, as long as you don't ruin somebody else's fun for it. Who isn't an asshole, of course. If they're a troll and they're, they're blocking you, then that doesn't apply, of course. So, any regular player that's minding their own business, you ruin their day, that's on you. Duh. Now, in this case, it's kind of ruining my day is that the enemy heavies are all the way over there, and while they do have a very good advantage over the IS-6, they're not really doing anything else to help out over here, and obviously the IS-6 is now gone, so I want to get out of this position, out of this situation, because there is no advantage for me to be had here. The SU-130 is going to go down anyway. There is no gain for the team in helping that SU-130 over there, because then I have 303 hit points, I'm just going to die with them. So I'm going to have to, again, reposition myself, get behind the heavies and use the heavies armor as an extension of my own hit points to be able to apply the two short auto loader to the enemy, basically. So all those kind of things, you know, once, once you start thinking about the dynamics of the battle, that's when you're going to start to get a good player. You can think about uh, stats and map positions and whatever, whatever you want. As long as you don't start thinking about the dynamics of how a battle works, you're not going to go up uh, to a very high skill level. Of course, you got to know how the battles work. And for that, you're going to have to play a lot of battles. You have to make a lot of mistakes. And you have to learn from those mistakes and then figure out how the battle usually plays out. And in this case, I know I'm far enough away. I'm not going to uh, get spotted unless I fire at him. So i got to pull back. See? Because that's the thing about camo rating. Camo rating doesn't matter if you fire. It only matters before you fire. When you shoot, it's out the window anyway, unless you're outside the enemy's view range. Right, so if you want to really be safe, be outside the enemy's view range. Otherwise, you're not safe because you can just get spotted by firing a shell. And in this case, I have enough hit points to take one shot. I'll be fine. Now I have 110. Two enemies left. The heavies are doing a great job. Yeah, I'm playing from the back here. What would I have gained from head-on staying there where the SU-130 was? Nothing. I would have simply just died. So I repositioned around the map, went behind the heavies, and I can still do more damage from back here and even have the ability to go around and attack the M3 Yaw as well and get some extra damage there while the heavies are busy with the Louis, who somehow hasn't made an effort to run away and perhaps confront me on this side of the map, who's just stayed there and fight the heavies head on, which is exactly what you don't want to do in a medium like this. You don't want to fight the enemies head on. You want to do this. You want to be sneaky. You want to be behind them. And then that is 4,000 damage. Boom. Did I play this battle perfectly? No. Do you need to play every battle perfectly to do really well? Also, no. But this tank, it's pretty nice.
The armor on the Murat is uh, not there. I mean, the upper plate, 200 millimeters, you still can pen it. I mean, obviously, if you use the 9 degrees of gun depression, you can't pen the upper plate because of the angle. But generally, the hull is paper all around. You can pen it very easily. And why would you shoot at the upper plate when the lower plate is so goddamn massive? The turret sides, as it bulges out, is also quite weak. And shooting at the front plate of the mantlet here isn't really the best of ideas because you have the spaced plates in between, so you might have some trouble. So if you can shoot at the sides here, shoot there. Uh, if you don't, just fire at the middle here. 300 millimeters, and see, that's the problem. Like, sometimes you have 400 millimeters, sometimes you have 270. So ideally, if you're shooting at the turret, go for the side plates here because they're extremely thin. And obviously, the sides in the rear, they're flat, they're thin, there's nothing going on. Don't even bother trying to side scrape a vehicle like this one. Uh, Try to play it somewhat hull down. I mean, obviously, the uh, gun does peak out, but because of the angle being this uh, massive, you're not going to be able to pen that, so don't even try. Even if it's poking out, don't bother trying to shoot at that. It's not going to happen. But uh, 9 degrees of gun depression is going to be good enough to hide most of the hull, to hide the massive lower plate. Um, so try to shoot at the side of the vehicle here if you are facing it. And obviously, like on any other vehicle in the entire game, keep the vehicle moving if you're not firing and you're out in the open and an enemy can fire at you. If an enemy can fire at you, move the vehicle around to throw off their aim. And now let's get into the battling with the new tier 10 French vehicle. And we want to start off with uh, another one of Wargaming's excellent wisdom of making the game worse than it has to be. This vehicle has 370 Alpha damage instead of what is usual for 120 millimeter guns, which would be 400. Now, why is that a bad thing that the same uh, caliber guns have essentially randomly assigned alpha damage of 370, 400, 410, whatever? It makes the game more difficult for a new player to learn. If you know what a vehicle's caliber is, like you know a T125 is 120 millimeters. And this one's 120 millimeters, the Super Conqueror is 120 millimeters, you can very easily be like, all right, that's 400 alpha damage. But if you change the alpha damage value of every tank seemingly at random, you're gonna make it a lot more difficult for new players to figure out what is what. So that is another pointless complication of the game that is unnecessary, right? Because you can make vehicles different, not by changing the alpha damage by 10. Like that's not gonna change anything. It's just gonna make it more confusing for everybody. So, not great, but it's wargaming we're talking about. And also my hit points here are not very great because the enemy has made one of the two fatal mistakes that you can make when you play together in a team. One is to play too close together and the other one is spread out too far. Because in one case, you're just gonna start blocking each other and stopping each other from being effective. And in the other case, you're gonna be spread out too far to be able to actively help each other. So you want to spread out, but not too far, which is why most of the time going to the middle and the medium side is preferable uh, because the middle and the medium side in most maps is more connected than the city to the middle and the medium side. So that's where that comes from. Basically, you want to gain map control, but not at the expense of giving up support for all sides of the team, right? And if you have a problem where you have to give up support for the other side of the team as you saw earlier in the uh, desert project louis battle then you want to push through where you have the advantage and uh, simply gain back that control that you sort of gave up by abandoning a part of the team somewhere out there now here this is a little bit of an oversight because that chieftain if he wanted to could peek forward take a shot but i know that he just fired which means that I have about five seconds to jump over the hill here and be safe still. But again, things like this could lead to a death if they're not calculated enough or if they're miscalculated or if they're simply not calculated at all. So just be aware of things like that. That even if somebody knows how to play a game, they are still gonna make mistakes. Sometimes because they just happen. Sometimes because they don't care. So be aware of that that don't copy everything only copy the things that are done correctly right and if you can identify what's right and wrong you're already on the path to become a good player if you can read the battle if you understand okay that move wasn't optimal then you're starting to think 
you just look at a battle like this one and be like, oh my god, this guy's so good, he did 4,000 damage. You're not thinking enough. Right? Because even a 4,000 damage battle is going to have slight errors, slight inaccuracies. A place where I peaked a little bit too far. A place where I could have moved somewhere else and done more damage. All those kind of things. They are part of every battle. Even the best of battles could have always... There's always something that could have been done just a little bit better. And you shouldn't be too harsh on yourself and be like, Oh no, I, did, I made that mistake, I made that mistake. That's not what this is about. You want to understand that those mistakes happen and then try and avoid them before they happen, right? You don't want to be mad that they happen. You just want to look at, okay, that happened. I should avoid doing that by doing it different the next time. That's the optimal approach here. For example, what I'm doing here. I gotta be careful peeking this leopard and the leopard is doing me a great service here by peeking like an absolute stupido. Basically, just giving me free hit points. I know. There are two enemy tank destroyers. A Waffentrager, which I know where he is, and a 4005. So what I have here, two tank destroyers as a support. There are three enemies in this area. One enemy that currently I don't know the location of, because three here, three over there. I don't know where the fourth guy is. That is a 4005. Now he's over there. Now it means I can push forward right here. I can take out this WT without having to worry, without being shot uh, from the bushes back there because there is nobody left the other guy is down there so it's all those all those kind of things that you put together that eventually are gonna like one ingredient isn't gonna make a good soup you gotta put them all together to have a good soup sometimes if you leave out a little bit of salt if you put a little bit too too much potato in it you're not gonna ruin it it's not gonna be perfect but it's still gonna be fine it's still gonna taste well um but ideally you want to refine the recipe for the next time and make it even better. And I'm hungry now. And I hope you are too, because food is good. This vehicle, though, it's one of those tanks that you don't have. It's not, oh my god, I have to have it. And it's not, Jesus Christ, it's the CS-63. It's neither of those two. It's not a must-have, but it's definitely a can-have. Don't stop grinding whatever you're grinding to get this one. It's not your E50M. Again, it's not your Leopard. It's not one of those vehicles that you should definitely have. It's not an E100. It's not an I7. But it is a vehicle that is... After you obtain all the excellent vehicle, it's still a vehicle that is worth picking up. Eventually. If you've got the time for it. If you've got the interest in it. If you've got something like a Batchat, it's not going to translate completely. Uh, in terms of playstyle, but it's going to be somewhat similar enough that I can tell you that if you don't like the bat chat, if you don't like how the TVP plays, if you don't like how the Progetto plays, you're also not going to like how this vehicle plays, most likely, because there's always going to be outliers. Duh. So, just keep that in mind. If you already have those vehicles, you grind those vehicles, and you really don't like how they play, you're most likely not going to like this one either. You could try but most likely, there is going to be no point in getting it. But if you really love the Batcher, if you really love the TVP that you already have, get it. Absolutely. Definitely worth it. The Leopard there, he has no idea that this vehicle is a two-shot autoloader. And he just peeks out. He stays out in the open. He doesn't peek back quickly. And he gets finished off. That's another thing that's very important. Once you fire, you have no place being out in the open. If you have fired your gun... You have to get into cover. Now. Better fire while already getting back into cover. If, with the medium. So. You know, because if you're driving very slowly. Like if you start driving and then you fire. You're still going to be accurate enough to hit your shell. But you're already driving backwards. So that's another technique that's extremely useful. And uh, that I, one that I definitely recommend picking up. Eventually the faster you are. The faster you peak. The faster you think. The more of an advantage you're going to have especially with a medium tank like this one. So keep that in mind. And obviously what am I doing here? I see, all right, there's two enemies over there. There's the teammate. He's going to die. There is no point driving over there because then I'm just going to, you know, die with them because remember, space can be used as extra armor. The time the enemy takes to come to me is time I can use to set up a side screen. Go hold down. 
Reload my gun. Angle my tank. Drive around a rock. All those kind of things. So in a way, distance is a form of assistance for you. And if you're too close to the enemy team, you often don't have as many options as if you're further away from them. You can plan your approach with a little bit more thought. Basically. So, I think, I think I'm throwing everything into this video. And that's kind of the problem. Right? Because once you boil down Blitz to its most essential points, the one things that are actually important, you run through them quite quickly. Right? Because the majority of battles, once you get the basics, once you have uh, the game awareness, once you have the map awareness, once you know how the tanks work, once you know how the average battle unfolds, once you know how to read the battle, once you know all the little tricks that exist, you know, like the peeking fast, like, you know, wiggling your tank and all those kind of things, or... You know, once you know all those things, it sort of gets straight forward. And everything I say on top of that is just repeating the same thing again. Right? So, yeah. Well, 1v3. Can I win this battle? Probably not. But, is it worth now throwing it away? No. I can still do the best I can. Even if the team doesn't do the best they can, or maybe they just can't do it any better, you can still do the best that you can, right? Because if you carry your own weight, if you're doing average, that's all you ever needed. And this vehicle might not be perfect for the average player. Definitely wouldn't recommend it there, especially if you're inexperienced. If you're new to the game, I would not recommend this tech tree whatsoever. But if you're semi-decent at the game and you like other vehicles, similar-ish playstyles, like a Batshat, like a TVP, then this tech tree is certainly still worth picking up as well. So with that said, thank you very much for watching. Put it down in the comments. Have you already gotten it? What do you think about it? And see you in the next one.